touch on a couple. So the rule around media communication, we were uh, looking at and we were asked to look at uh, a couple of years ago, oh, well, are you going to have a rule about social media? And uh, we looked at this. Um, my partner, Jeff Abrams, who's not able to be here today, but you know him from other training, um, he and I are part of a a uh, relatively recently formed group called Municipal Integrity Commissioners of Ontario. We're trying to bring some consistency to the approach of integrity commissioners in municipalities. So one of the areas that we've looked at is social media because it's very apropos. And we thought really media communication should cover social media. Social media is just another form of communicating. So the rule on media communication applies to uh, media communication with the media, but communicating no matter how it's um, done, no matter what the means is. So the rule speaks about accurately communicating decisions, even if a member disagrees, uh, and supporting the primacy of counsel in the democratic process. So what does that mean? That means it's inappropriate to say things like, well, I can't believe they decided X those bunch of you-know-whats, I totally disagree. No, it would be appropriate to say, I didn't support that decision, I disagree with that decision, but the vote was held and the decision was carried. So it's really important in the democratic process to maintain that respect for the process itself and for your colleagues on council. So to refrain from disparaging other members of council and that includes, that's why we say it's particularly important with social media. It includes tweeting and Facebook posts and those kinds of things that can become very informal and feel like just a conversation. And we see evidence of this in other uh, jurisdictions where people think it's a comfortable kind of informal approach to say, I disagree. And maybe they throw a little name out there or a few choice words. And those things are now part of a post that is really perhaps attributed back to the member of council who has maybe created the Facebook or started the tweet. So we just say, you know, um, be careful and cautious before jumping into the social media fray because those things can form the basis for a complaint about conduct of a council member. If the council members created it, facilitated it, or retweeted it, those can sometimes come to us in the form of complaints. It hasn't been the case in Gray County, but it has been in some jurisdictions. And finally, this rule that I've mentioned, which is the ability to seek the advice and act on the advice of the integrity commissioner. So when we do receive a formal complaint, and I will tell you right off the bat, in Gray County, we haven't had a lot of formal complaints, and we'll talk about that in the annual report, which is the next item up, I believe. We first look at that carefully to, de to determine, uh, is it even a matter within our jurisdiction? So we do a, a sort of a triage at the front end when we receive a complaint. So we'll say, you know, have you tried to resolve the matter? Who have you spoken to? Um, if it's a matter that somebody's complaining about really an operational issue, we'll redirect them to the operational, the appropriate operational staff. Uh, if it's a matter that we don't, for example, stand in judgment of council decisions. So if somebody comes to us and they really disagree with the decision, we don't deal with those matters. We're not here to determine whether a council decision was a good decision or not. So we redirect or we basically down the ball on as many uh, matters as we are able to, and that's part of our classification process. If it's within our jurisdiction and it's in the public interest, then we will investigate. And as I said, an investigation, if we find it uh, can't be resolved, will form the basis of a report to council. And that's all set out in your uh, code of conduct in the formal complaint procedure. And again, the formal sanctions, which we can impose or we can recommend that council impose, are a uh, sanction or a suspension of pay up to 90 days pay. 
And there are additional uh, recommendations that from time to time can be recommended by an integrity commissioner. It's in the hands of council to um, decide or not. Uh, but they would include, for example, removal from a committee, that kind of thing, where council has it in its ability to remove somebody from a committee. Those are rarely, rarely used, but they're spelled out in the uh, complaint protocol. So um, these next two charts really just set out the areas of jurisdiction of the integrity commissioner. And I think that pretty well covers the high points of the code of conduct and the complaint protocol that I wanted to, to address with you this morning. And the code of conduct is before you. And if you have specific questions on it, I don't know whether you want to ask now or if there's any questions that you had. I'm in your hands. I turned off your mic um, uh, just so I could speak. Uh, I think we'll deal with the uh, code of conduct uh, now and then uh, any questions that the councillors may have with respect to that, and then we can move on to the report. <coughs> uh, councillors, are there any questions? Uh, Councillor O'Leary. Thanks, Janice, for your uh, presentation. Is there any in, anything in place for the complainant that's that's chronic or never stops putting in complaints. Is there any control over that at all? Good. Um, so that's a good question. What we, and that's a question that gets asked of us from time to time. There is a provision right in the complaint protocol that uh, uh, allows us to uh, not deal with or not pursue an investigation on complaints that are frivolous or vexatious. Um, what our experience has been uh, overall, we are integrity commissioner to about 40 municipalities at present, so we see uh, it gives us an opportunity to have a, a big picture context. What we see uh, happening is where there is a complaint that is uh, I hate to use the word frivolous and vexatious, they're legalistic terms, but uh, unwarranted, unmerited, not much there. Uh, and we, we will provide a written response back to the complainant. And we do that in writing because if they wanted to pursue it further, they need to go to the ombudsman and we want to give a good concrete starting point. So we do like a kind of a three page or four, three or four paragraph, not page. Um, response as to why we will not be pursuing the matter because we want to be clear. Where there's a subsequent complaint from the same complainant, and I can't say it happens a lot, but where it does happen, and if we do not pursue that matter in the same way we say for these reasons, we will not be pursuing it, for those complainants, they generally go away because from their perspective, we're somehow now part of the problem. So they typically don't keep coming back at us. We, we, don't, we think that the solution is that they, uh, if they have a complaint that is merely frivolous or vexatious, we don't want to be entertaining that, but we want to be closing it down in a very uh, thorough and responsible way. So we do provide a couple of paragraphs back to them as to why we will not be pursuing it. Council Body. Uh, th thank you. Um, code of Conducts are basically a set of principles that need to be interpreted, I'm going to say widely, but responsibly with or with with, uh, with uh, my common sense, which your common sense might be a little bit different than mine or, or the next person. You know, 10 commandments are either 10 principles or else they're uh, 10 very tight rules with uh, nine big gaps in between. So a code of conduct, you don't want to have a 100-page uh, code of conduct that covers everything because there's still going to be stuff that falls in between. But yet, w we will get counselors now or in the future uh, who will say, well, it doesn't, it isn't there specifically, therefore I'm, uh, you know, it do doesn't apply to me. Um, I, and 
I, I'm, I'm, where, where I'm going is, it appears in this that uh, there is a gap in uh, some rules around open meetings uh, in this code of conduct, and I'm not exactly sure why. Um, recognizing the ombudsman says that a meeting isn't a meeting unless there's a quorum, so an email uh, trail isn't necessarily a meeting, but yet uh, the ombudsman also wants us to be open and transparent, and uh, we'll get, uh, it's possible that we would get a, a counselor who would uh, maybe go on and discuss for at length about uh, stuff in closed session and maybe not so much in detail and then share the email with the wrong parties. Um, and it doesn't matter what we say to them that this shouldn't be going on because the ombudsman says it's not a meeting, therefore I can discuss it. But it's still advancing business. It's still uh, argumentative, it's discussing, it's, and there's nothing about that in our code of conduct that I think is missing. Thanks. Great. Hi, Mom. So, okay, that is a, a valid observation. There is nothing in the code of conduct that speaks to the rules around open meetings. And that is not uh, accidental, it's not inadvertent. The set of rules around open meetings are under t section 238 and 239 of the Municipal Act and the cases under that. Um, and the decisions under that, which started with the court 30 years ago because that, that was the only parties that really had the wherewithal to go to court on those matters were really sound and press and that kind of thing. So the decisions of the ombudsman or the uh, recommendations of the ombudsman uh, have become very important. Many municipalities also have their own closed meeting investigator um, and their AMO has LAS, which uh, creates the opportunity to have an other body. But all of which is to say there is a whole body of, I'm going to loosely call it law, around um, when meetings must be open and when they may be closed and how that is all treated. And the piece that would fall within the code of conduct would be when a member of council is um, acting in a way that's contrary to the code of conduct by talking about things that were enclosed. That would be a code of conduct matter. The council member's conduct or behavior in, let's say, chatting or sharing with others about what was discussed and closed is another issue than should it have been a closed meeting or is it a closed meeting. So they're kind of two separate areas, but they dovetail. So when a matter can be enclosed and all of that, there is a body of law. That's the ombudsman and the closed meeting investigators that have created that. And how a council member needs to conduct themselves in terms of not inappropriately sharing that information, that becomes a code of conduct issue. And that would be something that if we, and we have seen situations where members of council sometimes inadvertently are spilling the beans on something, not realizing how the rules are working, we will start with uh, an outreach and a sharp elbow to say, councillor, I don't know if you're aware, but that really was a matter that was in close and hasn't gone public, et cetera, or we will encourage the conversation to happen. But ultimately it would, if, when, if it went uncorrected, if the member didn't course correct, or didn't recognize that, oh, sorry, I didn't realize that. Okay, that won't happen again. If there was no course correction, then the integrity commissioner would be the appropriate uh, authority to bring a report to say that member of council is consistently sharing what is closed meeting material. Does that, does that help? Uh, thank you for that. Maybe I, I, I mixed two different examples. So there is one time perhaps of a uh, potentially one time uh, that uh, it was emailed to the wrong parties. But beyond that, just the simple consistent discussion about what we're going to be talking about, email discussion about what should be happening in a meeting, um, whether it's disclosed to the wrong parties or not, it's consistently coming to council and we're consistently saying, you can't do that, save it for the meeting, and it's these rules don't apply to me. That's why I was looking for a framework that we could say it's there, it's clear um, in the code of conduct. Now, that helps. Um, that is 
It's really such a good question. And I think there's an, an opportunity. I don't know that it's in the code of conduct, but there's certainly an opportunity to bring a little more uh, education and training uh, on the issue of uh, when it's appropriate or how it's appropriate to be um, communicating to move the business of council forward in a way that's not in a properly called meeting. So that's, it's a very real issue. It's an issue that in some jurisdictions uh, in the states they have referred to uh, because they have very strict open meeting um, rules in a lot of jurisdictions in the states. So a lot of our case law tends to come from that. They call that walking meetings. So it's really um, sharing, communicating between members of council about something that council's going to be deciding and it's moving that forward through that off the radar conversation that occurs and it's contrary to the public interest to do that. It's contrary to the principles of transparency to be doing that. So it's a good point. I'm not entirely sure that it needs to find a place in the code of conduct, but there's an opportunity perhaps to, for more robust guidance on the closed meeting side of things. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Martin, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, thank you for all the work on this. I, I did want to uh, note a couple of transitional paragraphs in it that probably could be taken out before we uh, adopt it fully. Um, and they are um, regarding the references to the March 1st, 2019 before and after. There's one on Schedule A and one on Schedule B. They could just come out because I think that is rather confusing to the general public. And the second follows mm -hmm. on uh, Councillor uh, Bodie's comment regarding confidential information or closed session confidential information. Um, we have um, a question sort of circulating as to when it's discussed and closed and it has not been moved into open in a formal way. However, it becomes known in the general public. Can or cannot a member discuss it at that point? It's not, there we go, I'm good, sorry. I'm, I've got to press it. I don't have to unpress it. You do that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So that that's a good question, and um, I will uh, venture to answer that. So, um, in this way, when uh, there is a discussion of a matter in closed session, it often is going to be the case that members of the public are aware because it's listed on a public report this matter is going to be discussed and closed. So it's often going to be the case that there's an awareness publicly that that's what's being discussed. If the um, outcome hasn't been shared out of closed, right, you haven't moved open to say uh, we've decided X, Y, Z, move a resolution, pass it, done, if none of that's occurred, it's just a discussion that's occurred in closed session and you move open and you don't discuss anything further, then it would be inappropriate to share what was discussed and closed about it. Um, but even in the circumstances where council moves open and says, based on our discussion and close, we're going to move uh, whatever, sale of this property or whatever council decides to do with a certain issue, we're going to decide to bring this litigation or what have you. It's inappropriate to be sharing what the conversation was or who supported what or who said what. That's all closed. So even though the outcome might be known, the outcome might be announced by council, and in fact there might in fact be a communication strategy by council, well, when we come open, we're going to say this, and then there's going to be this little meeting with the media, and that might be all decided, but all of the other conversation that took place in closed is still confidential. Who said what about what and how they supported or didn't. Is that helpful? Yeah. 
So do I hit the Now over to me. Okay, Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Warden. Thanks, Janice. Just a question around the uh, non-disqualifying interests. My concern, you know, from a small municipality, a small town, is that we sit on a lot of different boards and there's going to be a long list of those transparency forms that we're going to have to fill out. Can you just uh, provide a little more information on, you know, when we should be doing it? Do you need to do it every time, you know, if you sit on an agricultural society, every time the Ag Society is coming to council, do you need to file a separate form or just one form saying that you have some uh, allegiance to the uh, agriculture society? Does that apply or do you need to fill out, fill out the form each time? Sorry, Councilor, I'd, I had already cut you off, uh, okay. anticipating she would be answering. Okay, so it's, um, if the, uh, if it's uh, a transparency disclosure to say, I sit on the Agricultural Society, uh, but I do it because I'm a council appointee, for example, if, if that were an example, then I would suggest it really isn't necessary to do it every time. It would probably be sufficient to do it at the beginning of the term or the first time that the Agricultural Society or, or whatever organization appears before council to make that statement or just put it on the forum and fill it out. Um, on the other hand, if it's a uh, disqualifying interest, so, and that's a big difference. If it's a non-disqualifying interest, it's I'm on that body, uh, typical one would be conservation authority. I will be participating, I sit on the conservation authority, I do so because I was appointed by council. So I'm exempt, that's an exception, and I will be participating. And that kind of a statement or declaration would be made at the first time that that body came before council in a new term, for example. I think that would be sufficient. I, there aren't real ground rules, rules on this, but that would make sense that that would be sufficient because it's there, it's on the record, and for the balance of the term, I wouldn't think the council member would need to say that again. On the other hand, if it's a disqualifying interest, the council member has an obligation at the beginning of every meeting when that matter, a matter in which a member has a disqualifying interest has to be stated at the beginning of the meeting. So at the point in time where the clerk asks for uh, declarations of interest, the council member needs to say, I have a declaration of interest on the matter that's coming before us with respect to X. So that's one part. The other part is service clubs. Service clubs are complicated under the Ontario framework because the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, not the code, it's the act, does not create an exception for membership in a service club, as does, for example, the Alberta legislation. That creates a, a a strict black and white exception. If the member has a conflict by virtue of being a member of a service club, that's exempt. We don't have that in Ontario. So that's the kind of trap for the unwary in the legislation that the member has to be aware of. If the um, service club, I don't know, whatever, Rotary or whatever service club comes before the body, the council, for funds or service in kind or anything really that would be of a pecuniary interest to that service club and the member is a member of that club, Kiwanis or what have you, the member has to declare an interest. It seems difficult to really as a concept, but it's because of the legislation. There's no except, exception for service clubs memberships. Is that, that's not that helpful. Chamber of Commerce then would apply also? Good, good uh, um, supplementary question. Um, yes, we've looked at this elsewhere. The Chamber of Commerce would apply, but the difference is that the Chamber of Commer Commerce rarely uh, comes to council asking for anything. Typically what we've seen is that the Chamber of Commerce comes 
to advise or announce. So I, I don't know if that's helpful. I mean, it's important to look at from, it's important for the member to look at whether the body has actually got a pecuniary interest or are they just coming to give us a good news story. If they're just coming to give a good news story, then that's not, it's not a pecuniary interest. If they're coming to ask for some kind of contribution, assistance, aid, uh, that's why I say uh, a grant or service in kind, those are pecuniary interests. And so just to be clear, a pecuniary interest uh, would not include th them saying, can we raise the flag or can you declare it a uh, special such and such day? Right, correct, absolutely. Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I would wonder, um, if council is so inclined and should the decision flow that um, uh, this uh, policy is passed, could we have a workshop on it? So all the ins and outs and, um, you know, just to become more familiar with it. So that would be something that I would put forward as a suggestion and a move forward to ensure the integrity of the process. I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads, so I think the answer is yes. Councillor Soever. Along the same lines, um, um, many municipalities have a code of conduct review committee where there's an opportunity to discuss for an extended period of time and, and then bring a report from that committee after the integrity commissioner has worked with them to back to council. Um, obviously, we've chosen not to here. Um, what would your... Um, feelings be on having a code of conduct review committee so that you know there is a more public ours is public um, we don't get a lot of members of the public out but I know there's been some very good discussion and, and people are starting to get a better feel uh, the community as well as councillors for what the issues are rather than just having a report brought to us I know I have a lot of little questions here but I don't know if we have the time to deal with them today but that's just more of a general uh, question. D how many of the municipalities that you, w you work with actually have a code of conduct review committee? Good, so um, thank you for that question. We do work with uh, a couple of um, review committees or uh, governance committees or policy committees, uh, which are subcommittees of council on these things. I would, be lying if I said that was our preference. Our preference is to work with all of council. We think there's a huge uh, benefit to all of council being able to discuss these things. When we bring uh, training, um, not committee recommendations necessarily, so thinking of the training and the workshopping, we like to do that in a closed session. We take advantage of the Municipal Act provision that allows education and training to occur in closed we think we get the best dialogue and questions and answers in that way. We get the best engagement um, and changes aren't recommended. That's an opportunity for council members to understand their code, to sort of uh, question and probe what does this mean and how does this get applied and have you seen this anywhere and have you seen that and what about this situation? We think that's best done in a closed without any recommendations of changes. Working with a committee is really geared towards what changes are we looking at. And what you've got in front of you is a document that um, you can tell from the comment about removing the reference to March 1st. The draft of this began many, many months ago. And it's been in, in the works. And so whereas there might be in the future, in a couple of years, an opportunity to set up a committee to look at are there areas we want to look more carefully at, Remember those committee meetings, those are public committee meetings. Other members of council can attend, but they're not the same purpose as having a workshop. They're about making changes to a document. So maybe that will be something that you'll wanna do in a couple of years. But for now, we, we would certainly think the opportunity for further understanding of the code you've got is the best way to go. Yes, um, 
okay so one of the one of the issues um, that we'd like some clarity on is is um, the rule 15 um, as as a member of county council county council may decide on something that is is not um, in the best interest of the lower tier municipality and the lower tier municipality may um, want to lobby the provincial government to change a rule or a process or a procedure. Um, and also, um, paragraph two there says, will not engage in litigation or other legal challenges against the municipality. But if a member here, who's a member of county council, is also the mayor or deputy mayor of a municipality, and there is a legal dispute between the lower tier and the upper tier, um, you know, I think maybe it'd be useful to have some clarity that, you know, when you're acting in that capacity that you are allowed to lobby the province and and so on in the best interest of your community. Um, through the warden, that's, that's a great point. And I think that would be an, uh, an excellent point of clarification that uh, we could introduce uh, into the commentary. And as I mentioned earlier, the commentary can be updated without having to amend the rule. But that's such a great point that uh, I don't think we'd actually overtly turned our mind to clarifying. It's a, it's a good point. Okay. Thank you. I don't see any other uh, questions or comments. And if that is the case, then I'm going to invite uh, Council Mackey. Thanks, Warden. Just a comment. Um, is the county, and maybe through you to Kim, is the county planning another uh, another session, training session with the uh, the changes? Because certainly, you know, reading through it, I know I could benefit from a little bit more time. I mean, I don't want to have to apologize to Councillor Millen for something, um, you know, <laughs> on a challenge, but. <laughs> Oh, mercy. I'm not seeing it. I think hearing the discussion here today that we need to uh, work with Jeff and Janice and find an appropriate time where we can really, you know, devote some, you know, unstructured time to having a good discussion about the various details that we've kind of only just touched on today. Okay. Thank you, back to me. Uh, oh, Councillor McQueen. Procedurally, um, I know a lot of our lower tier municipalities adopted our original code of conduct. Moving forward, are they going to be looking at revising theirs from what we've done here? And if that's true, probably if you're looking at a training session, you may want to invite some of those lower tiers if you're going to have time well spent, because they also should be included if they're going to adopt it. Just saying. Thank you, and, and actually I was anticipating that question. Um, I think they're looking at um, sort of what happens at the county first, and then we'll, we'll meet with the Gray County clerks. Uh, we meet on a regular basis now that uh, the summer is over, so we will be meeting shortly, and that'll be a topic of discussion, absolutely. And then it will be up to each individual council to determine um, what their code of conduct should be. Okay, so I think that, um, oh, Councillor Soever. One quick philosophical thing um, that's not, um, and this has come up as we, we are busily working on the Town of Blue Mountains to revise our code of conduct. And the issue comes up, um, the respondent as a councillor is always identified in the report, but the complainant, um, well, there seems to be a difference of opinion on that, whether the complainant can be identified. Now I know our, this code here says whatever the integrity commissioner feels is necessary for a report can be revealed. Um, there's an argument maybe the Municipal Act says that the complainant can never be revealed or the Municipal Freedom of Information Act. And I think one of the discussions we're having is at least in the case where the complainant is uh, another counselor, they're both kind of acting in a public capacity 
And, you know, what is your feeling on that? So um, there has been discussion about that uh, in, the, in the sector, and uh, so that's an excellent question. Our view is that um, the, where the complainant is another elected official, it's always appropriate to identify the complainant. Uh, we typically do um, identify um, complainants if the issue is very much in the public already, but um, we exercise some discretion in not identifying complainants where the issue is of public interest, but it's really not particularly germane who the complainant was that brought it forward. And where the matter, for example, from time to time, the matter might be a matter of staff complaining, we almost never identify those staff. We might from time to time identify, let's say, a CAO who might be a spokesperson for a group of staff. It, it's, it's really a question of trying to balance the interest, the public interest, and fairness. Oh. Thank you for that. That seems very um, common sense and logical. Um, we wish, uh, well, anyway, we better stop. <laughs> Councillor Dobreen. Thank you, Mr. Warden. In the interest of making sure that all representatives are properly um, advised and trained, if there is such a workshop, I'm wondering if it could be open to the alternates so that we can understand the code of conduct from the county perspective um, at the same time. I think that's appropriate. Okay, anything else? I'm ready to call the question. I think we've had some good discussion. Uh, there's going to be a follow-up in terms of the Council Robinson's uh, uh, suggestion for a training or a workshop. Uh, and so on the motion to receive and endorse, um, I, I call the question, all those in favor? Are there any imposed? That is carried. Thank you. <coughs> so we move on to 6B. Do we need to uh, do, we have our delegation here too. Oh, All right, yes, yes. But I've uh -huh. got fire chiefs here, I don't know how long they're going to be there. Okay, can we just huddle for a second? Okay, so, sorry and thank you for that uh, indulgence. Uh, we're gonna take uh, a short, very short, uh, two minute break. Uh, we're gonna organize uh, some things and speak with some people in the gallery and then we'll come right back. So literally two minutes.
Okay, so I call the meeting back to order. Just for information, we're going to deal with item 6B, uh, and from there we'll move to our second uh, delegation under item 3. So 6B, the annual report of the Integrity Commissioner. I'll look for a mover to put that on the floor. Uh, moved by Councillor Bartnicki, seconded by Councillor Milne. And Heather? Oops. Um, really, Janice is here if there are any questions um, about the report. Um, she's provided that to us as part of their uh, con annual contract is to provide an annual report to us. So it is there and Janice is available if there are any questions related to the annual report. Councillor Soever. Yes, thank you for, for this report. And um, I've seen other reports where they, they actually have a little table to say what the level of workload was. Like, so you say, well, we had so many requests for advice, uh, so many um, requests, informal investigations, formal investigations, without discussing what they were, so that, you know, council could have an idea about, you know, what really is the level of service that you're being asked to provide. So uh, thank you for the question. We also have seen different formats of annual reports. As you may or may not know, uh, Jeff and I formed uh, Principles Integrity uh, two years ago. So we're, we're relatively new into this field. Uh, we also are both uh, retirees of municipal sector with 30 plus years experience. So we have seen many tables in our lives with many graphs and many numbers and sometimes they're meaningful and sometimes they're not all that meaningful so the way we provide the information we think provides a glimpse or a snapshot and we are certainly prepared to provide more or speak to those uh, greater levels of detail but uh, what I came prepared today to speak to is just to verbalize on on what work we have been doing so have we earned our keep and what have we been busy doing um, and we Basically, uh, we think the way the Integrity Commissioner framework and the Code of Conduct, the role of the advice and the education and training in Gray County has, has been, it's working the way we think it should be working. It's working in the best way, which is there's a little behind the scenes advice from time to time. And in that vein, it's confidential advice that we provide to members if they ask us for advice and say, here's the facts and what do you think and what should I do? We provide that written advice back to them. And we've had three such written uh, advice uh, opinions or written advice that we've provided back to members. We have had uh, uh, one complaint that uh, got resolved without need for a full recommendation report to council. So that's one of those where we got into it, we did conduct some investigative work, we looked at it, and then we had an ability to resolve a matter without having to bring a recommendation report. So we have also, though, um, as you may recall, when we first were retained back in January of 2018, uh, we provided training to county council. And then following orientation, we had the opportunity to come together with uh, county uh, and lower tier um, councillors to provide a very large, there was a, a full day of orientation and we participated in that. And that was, there were big large numbers on, uh, in theater seating and uh, it was a wonderful day of um, orientation and training that we were able to participate in. And I would say probably maybe as a result of some of that, we haven't had uh, quite the number of uh, questions that we would have normally anticipated. And plus, not all of the lower tiers have had to get training from us or have, have asked us to come in for training. And we think that's because they participated in that full day orientation. So we, we think it was value. Um, we have a $1,000 a year retainer that we feel is it's earned upon appointment. That's the annual retainer. And everything else is services built, services delivered, services built. We don't have any 
you know, fifteen or twenty thousand dollar year riding retainers. It's just we bill what we deliver. So that's kind of where we are. Um, and altogether, we've billed uh, ten thousand dollars over two years. So it's about a five thousand dollar year to date. So we think this is the way a good, robust ethical framework should work. People get the advice when they need it. And otherwise, we're just providing some education and training when you want it. Councillor Bartnicki. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I find that um, the county has set a budget for an overall. And for us to really decide um, if our budget's realistic and what our training needs might be, it would be really helpful to tease out um, the themes, which you have done in part. You've, you've identified um, disparaging comments and nobody here would ever do anything like that, I'm sure. Um, but I, I think that we do need some numbers and I'm also thinking that your association, your newly formed association, will also identify kinds of complaints and the types of advice that are really um, being requested over and over. When we know that, then it gives us a heads up to be more vigilant in what kinds of things might trip us up. So I, I think that that would be very helpful in future reports. So I'm thinking this is the sort of thing that will come up uh, in the workshop that we'll uh, will be having. Um, and I'm also um, just reminding myself that I believe the Ombudsman you know, puts out sort of trends and reports about um, if you're looking for sort of data about trends, you could get that from the Ombudsman reports as well. Anyone else? Great, so on the motion to receive the annual report, all those in favor? Are there any opposed? That's carried, thank you very much. Okay, so we will now turn to our second delegation. Mr. How do I pronounce that last name? Voot. Voot, Mr. Ed Voot. Come forward. You have the floor, you just have to push the little button that has the green. Okay, I, uh, last time I came here was 2015 and I spoke in front of the Transportation Committee, so I didn't realize I was gonna be speaking in front of everybody, and I'm not a public speaker, but I'll do my best. Um, first of all, it says engine brake signs in uh, Singhampton. And I'd actually like to see engine brake signs return to all of Gray County. Um, the last council, for whatever reason, decided, and I don't know that it was last council or when it was first decided, but someone told me that the engine brake signs were all being removed because it was an insurance issue. But there's no other municipality or county that I can find in Ontario that... Um, has said there's a problem with engine brake signs and has removed them all. I've worked with um, Simcoe County to get a, a sign installed coming into Singhampton from the Simcoe County side, but with the increased truck traffic in all areas of Gray County, especially Singhampton, I think we need these signs to come back. I know they're not enforceable, but as a courtesy, if we could bring these signs back like all the other municipalities, I would really appreciate it if you guys could do that for us. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, Pat, is there anything you wanna add to this? Yeah, I just, uh, I, I, as, as Mr. Root said uh, last time, we just, it's not, a, it's not a regulatory or warning sign as per the Ontario Traffic Manual. So that's why it's not enforceable to us. Um, you know, not being a, a trucker myself, I'm not gonna tell uh, people in this room how much to use their engine brakes when they drive a truck. I know there's a lot of people that can 
I'm not one of them. Um, but I'm not, I don't, from a liability standpoint, we don't really feel like it's our job to tell a person when to use maybe a superior additional braking system or not. So that's kind of why we're staying away from that. And then just the cost of the signs, maintain the signs and that sort of thing. So um, that's why we've stayed away from them in the past. Anything else, sir? Okay, I understand we stayed away from them in the past, but why, again, I ask, why does Gray County have to be different from ev every other municipality or county in Ontario? And I know it's not enforceable, and I was in, in contact with the Ministry of Transportation, and engine brakes are actually not required on any truck in Ontario. It's an additional engine braking system. The only thing required in Ontario is air brakes or hydraulic brakes. So I'm not asking because I think it's enforceable. I'm asking that we get the signs back as a courtesy. That's all. The only other part that, that I would bring into this discussion, um, and it's just a, a slightly different perspective, and this comes from um, the Ontario Trucking Association, um, where their concern was that the real problem with unnecessary noise from trucks has to do with modified truck exhausts, not engine brakes. The fact is that modern engine brakes, now some of the trucks that we're seeing on the road are not perhaps your poster children for modern, but the fact is that modern engine brakes when operated properly do not actually cause an increase in noise levels. Proposing new laws and bylaws prohibiting the use of engine brakes is a mistake because the real culprit causing the excessive noise problem is actually modifications that have been made to the exhaust and I'm not sure why that's undertaken and maybe other people can say but. Councillor McQueen the camera hasn't moved yet um, I've been watching uh, so I guess in a sense it is sort of what you're saying is if it's non-mandatory and I've seen a lot of signs around through the province and they say it's please refrain from so you're saying is 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 it do we or can we bring back the ability to put these signs up in the sense of a courtesy sign just as a reminder to the, in, the individual driving the, the truck that you know please refrain just as a reminder sort of like a flashing sign it's it's sort of something that's there that it's just a reinforcement is that what you're sort of coming at sorry I didn't want to get into too much dialogue, but. Uh. Yes, like the one that Simcoe County put up for me just says, please refrain. I'm not asking us to change the laws. I know it's not enforceable in Ontario. I'm just saying it's a courtesy sign, that's all. Let me push all I want. Just in your, in your example with regards to uh, north of Southampton, uh, is there a certain time or configuration of this is happening where you live in the sense of like can you give us a little bit of detail what's happening there because I know you have that quarry to the north right Sorry. come on man even I can work it <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah like there's essentially three quarries that feed Singhampton there's the Walker the Sealy and the CBM quarry and it's basically from about 6 a.m. till 5 p.m. every weekday, pretty much all day. Now, there's a lot of trucks with modern engine brakes that you don't hear, but I'm telling you right now, there's some that'll go by at any time of the day that'll just scare the bejesus out of you. So just a courtesy, that's all I'm asking. Um, one other option that I was reading about online, just because some um, engine brakes are modern and quiet, um, there's always the noise bylaw of the municipality, which they can enforce, you know, the county doesn't, but there's always that option as well. You know, not to punish the, the quieter operators, maybe um, to put the foot down a bit on the louder operators. 
So to respond to that, I talk into the minist- or talk to the ministry. There's only two guys to enforce all of southwestern Ontario, and they have no time to be in Singhampton. I can tell you right now. I've talked to them. There's a lot more going on in southern Ontario than Singhampton. And remember, it's not punishment. It's just a courtesy request. Certainly, if it's the will of council, uh, given that, uh, you know, is it is it fair to say that the situation in Singhampton is one that's unique in the in the in the amount of traffic? It, is that would that be in a, a a conclusion that we could draw with the amount of of aggregate traffic that's there, Pat? Yeah, to me, there's a few hamlets, um, you know, in busy truck areas, but I don't, there probably wouldn't be any as busy as Singhampton as far as heavy trucks, yeah. Well, for the small investment in signage and that, for that one particularly painful location, can we put it up and at least try it? And then, Mr. Boot, you can see if it makes a difference and at least report that back to us? Councillor Mackey. Well, thanks, Warden, and thanks, Kim, for raising that point. Certainly with the number of small hamlets and county roads, we get these requests, you know, more than just Singhampton. I recognize Singhampton's got the, the large quarry, but, you know, if if council wanted to, you know, upon request of a, you know, residence from certain areas, you know, at least make it available. I'm not sure if it makes any difference or not, but... If it does, you know, stop one or two trucks from uh, from using their brakes, then for the people living in those small hamlets, it is very annoying. Thanks. Satisfactory. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Oh, Council, Council McQueen. A few years ago, uh, CBM had an open house for staff and councillors and stuff, and I think. As far as the operator, they do have a sign there that says, you know, when you're going through St. Hampton, please refrain from using it. So there is a operator. They're trying to tell the, the, the contractors to also, you know, keep it down. So they're, you know, this is not really against the operators. It's just the independent truckers that, that are moving the gravel. So just to want to make that note that it, this is not against the operators itself, right, or are the operators of the, because uh, they, they, they have been trying. And if I could just say one other thing, Um, I know everybody's hungry, I'm hungry too. Um, I work with uh, Natalie Hambleton, she's the the, um, weigh scale operator at CBM, and I actually have her email. I can email her directly with a truck company name or, or license plate or whatever, and if I report the same truck to her too many times, they actually get banned from the quarry for using their engine brakes because they're very interested in keeping the community happy too. Councillor Dobrin. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And to that point, sir, uh, we have in a small hamlet, Swinton Park, a green drying operation that uh, voluntarily offered to pay for those in the installation of those courtesy signs. So I am surprised that if they can be banned from operating or delivering or picking up from that quarry that they wouldn't um, perhaps um, help with that cost. Um, CBM actually gave us $10,000 to install a speed sign. I'm not sure we're gonna be able to go back to that well too many times. Okay, so we'll move forward. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, to the, looking at item um, 6C, uh, to the firefighters in the room, um, it is time for lunch, however, uh, and I understand that lunch is ready. Uh, however, if uh, we could keep it to 15 or 20 minutes, I, and I, I would hate to have to keep you guys here. Um, any longer than necessary, what is your wish? We could deal with you now. We're, quite prepared to do that, or would you prefer that it be after lunch? Not just 
So council is saying let's do it. Are, are you okay with that? Okay. And let's deal with item C. This is the enhanced fire communications report and recommendations. I'm looking for a mover to put the item on the table. Um, Councillor O'Leary moves, seconded by Councillor Robinson. And Kim? Council, the report before you is a follow-up to the information you received in February this year. You will recall that the nine fire services in Gray County had approached uh, staff, myself and Marlene, regarding the life safety and operational issues that they were experiencing with their communications infrastructure, and they asked if the county would provide support to assessing and addressing these issues. This has been a very collaborative effort. Um, the chiefs that are here today, all nine of them, have participated actively in our discussions, as has Owen Sound Police Dispatch, our Emergency uh, Management Coordinator, and our consultant, Dan Perlstein, who's also here today. Back in February, you uh, gave us approval to move forward with the first of a three-step process. And so what ha you have in front of you today is uh, Mr. Perlstein's assessment and recommendations uh, with regard to this situation with um, fire communications. So if I turn, ask you to turn to page 51 in the report, I've um, kind of tried to summarize in, in my report and really the, uh, the basis of, of Dan Perlstein's assessment. Dan was able to confirm that multiple fire services are using existing radio frequencies for multiple functions so both paging, dispatch, and sometimes tactical are all happening on the same frequency. This results in overlapping communications, missed communications, and interference among the frontline users. It also constrains the operational abilities of the fire service to deliver reliable and predictable performance. So this is the most significant issue that we're dealing with, and this is the life safety issue. Um, we also were able to uh, take a look at just the radio coverage itself and we know that um, it's not completely documented but it's certainly not sufficient. There are dead spots in our uh, radio transmission and communication infrastructure. Um, I think it, a critical point to bring forward in all of this is that um, Owen Sound Dispatch, who dispatches seven of the nine, um, is doing that on seven different radio configurations with various degrees of radio coverage and technical limitations using seven different dispatch procedures. This level of complexity in a situation just doesn't lend itself to, I think, the kind of seamless operation that we need in a time of, of an emergency. Um, dispatching fire services in such a constraining environment also poses challenges in terms of proper and complete dispatch processes as well as required follow-up and if necessary audit and I can't emphasize this enough and some of you have had this experience in your own municipalities in the event of an inquest it's critical to know what was communicated to who and when and what the response was we don't have that ability now and um, the amount of effort and expense that would go into trying to sort all of that out um, would be prohibitive if the situation arose. So moving forward with this would address some of those shortcomings. So moving on from that in the interests of time, so in light of the findings, Mr. Perlstein provided recommendations and these are summarized for you beginning on page 52. So in a nutshell, what are we trying to achieve with these recommendations? Separation of paging and dispatch communications functions, a county-wide paging infrastructure and interconnectivity, um, a public safety standard radio coverage of 95% of, of the county for mobile radios and vehicle repeaters 95% of the time, and the ability to capture a permanent record of radio communications for every incident. We want um, consolidated tactical and interoperability channels. We want to make sure that the infrastructure that we're putting in place is going to stand you in good stead for um, a period of 10 years. And finally, reliable and predictable infrastructure services and support based on mutually accepted service level agreements. 
So on the top of page 53 in your package, you see the six solutions that um, Mr. Perlstein put together for us to consider. And there you can see there's quite a, a wide variety and or variation, I should say, in the, in the cost of those solutions. The first two, solutions one and two, really don't address the breadth of the issue and I don't believe that they would provide good value for your money. Solutions three and four would deal in a much more comprehensive way the challenges that have been brought forward by the fire service. Solutions five and six are solutions that go to the next step and actually integrate um, the fire communications and interoperability with the police. And I want to um, be very clear with council that if everything was equal and we had our choice to implement any situation, the fire chiefs were um, very supportive of moving to a solution like solution five that allowed the, the, the communications with the police in a seamless way. Solutions five and six, um, while they require a higher initial investment, they also provide an opportunity to share some of the costs with the police on the initial infrastructure investment, as well as going forward when we're talking about administering a system, <coughs> now you've got more people to, to share those costs out. So there were some real benefits, but you'll see in the report what was recommended for you today was um, actually solution three. So that solution doesn't right today offer that complete interoperability with the police. But I didn't have a mandate to work with the police from you today. So if that's something that you want to consider in the future and you want to talk about this at your police services board and explore that further, that's certainly something that, that people, the counselors could do. Um, the other part of this is that radio frequencies are controlled by the federal government. So ISED controls the frequencies and right now, and I think we mentioned this back in February, it's very difficult to get additional frequencies. We're fortunate that um, Mr. Pearlstein has um, quite an extensive relationship um, with the folks at ISED. He feels that, and he's here if you wish him to speak to this directly, that solution three is something that from a frequency perspective, we can get through the provincial government um, in a more uh, expeditious manner. Solution five and six with integration to the police will take a little bit of a, a more concerted effort and we don't have a high degree of certainty that we can be successful there. So the bottom line is that what, we would, what we're recommending to council in order to um, move forward with a solution that's going to address the shortcomings in the fire communications is that we move forward with solution three. And when I say move forward, what we're asking to do is actually put this out to an RFP. Mr. Perlstein's made you know, some assumptions about what's required and what it will cost, but as you all know, I th the only way to have a sh real assurance on that is to actually put it out there and see what the, um, what the world is, is willing to provide and, and for what cost. Um, we would then be bringing back a report to council with the results of that RFP with more confirmed pricing and as well, I think it would give us an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the governance and management of a system should one be developed. I think throughout this whole process over the last several months, I think the one question that's you know come back to me about all of this is why is the county doing this? Why are you involved in this? And I think it's just the recognition that the challenges that we're facing now in fire communications are not challenges that are going to be solved by one individual fire service at a time. Um, we, I think the public has an expectation that um, the different fire departments can work together collaboratively in the, in the event of an emergency. 
and so you know creating that platform uh, irrespective of how it's paid for ultimately I think that's a whole other discussion but um, you know making sure that in an emergency situation and each one of these fire departments is integral to our emergency management plan um, is, is the way that uh, we can best move forward. So I'm happy to take questions here as best I can. I tried to shorten that up a lot. Councilor Mill. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, clearly, uh, communications in the fire service is a dog's breakfast. And uh, we want safety for the residents and or for our firefighters, our uh, re first responders. Uh, in my opinion, opinion, there's no point in taking half a pail of feed to the barn. We might as well fill it up and see what it'll get us. Uh, my question would be, is this scalable for when the province tells us to amalgamate with uh, Bruce County? Okay. Certainly the one tower that's um, part of Dan's report is the, is the tower in Walkerton. Um, I don't know that we did any assessment of uh, what the situation is with regard to radios, et cetera, in Bruce County. My anecdotal, what I heard around discussion around the table was that they were in a similar kind of situation to what we are today. Is that correct? So, um, I think there would need to be a, a project of a, of a similar f way within Bruce County to bring them up to this, but that's certainly possible. Councillor Robinson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Warden, and through you, I certainly have an appreciation and an understanding of why um, our uh, Fire departments uh, required an, an enhanced communication um, opportunity. Certainly, I support it as I'm the seconder of the motion. Um, so my support continues. But I'd like to see how we can uh, weave in the um, opportunity for our police services to um, become part of this. So what would you say would be the drill down approach to this? I, I think that the, the next steps would then be to um, have a discussion at the various police services board. And I don't know, Dan, do you want to, can you speak to that at all? You want to come on up? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the issue of integrating police with fire versus integrating fire in Gray County with fire in Bruce County becomes an issue of technology, amongst other things. And the technology used by police is different than the technology that's used by the fire departments, either in Bruce County or in Simcoe County, in terms of interoperability. So there are opportunities because radios are dual technology, radios that are installed in the vehicles, in the fire trucks, and so on and so forth. Whether the infrastructure can be integrated in such a way that will guarantee that we can get the frequency licenses from Industry Canada or ISET as they are today becomes an issue. And it's an issue that I don't have a great feeling about being able to resolve, simply because the province is right now out to implement their radio system for the OPP. And because of that, they put a hold on all the frequencies. <laughs> so I don't see that becoming a um, better situation in the next five years or so when the Premier of Ontario has committed to 2022 to have the system ready for the province. I don't believe it will be done by then. Uh, so until that system is ready, um, I don't think we can get Enough. Very hopeful about that. Enough frequencies to be able That's to number bring the one police issue. side on. Yeah. The most important issue here is because of the situation that exists today with the fire departments, a solution that resolves it, that resolves it 
sooner rather than later with the capability of expanding it when some things become clear, whether amalgamation with uh, Bruce County or whether police, fire, and other entities become one and can expand that. The equipment is certainly um, reusable. <coughs> there may be some additional cost in reconfiguring it and this, that, and the other, but I think that council probably would consider a solution that the fire departments can implement in the next, say, year or so, and give them the opportunity to, um, to have a, shall we call it proper, radio communication system uh, be the best solution. And that's why we're proposing uh, solution number three, which is almost guaranteed in terms of radio frequencies. Uh, it integrates, it makes the system a public safety quality radio system and it ensures that there's some issues related to liability both in the um, uh, county and the municipalities is being taken care of. Uh, we have Councillor Salavarin next. We, we've heard today about the uh, consultation with the various um, fire departments. Um, I received this memo dated 29, August 29, 2019 from our, our, our Deputy Fire Chief, now our Interim Fire Chief, and which um, says that the Town of Blue Mountains Fire Department upgraded their radio communications infrastructure at tw in 2013 at a cost of 60000 using three frequencies and two repeater towers to communicate effectively across our municipality. And he says the department can communicate with fire departments in Simcoe County and Gray County, which is often required during mutual aid incidents. Um, he's also, in anticipation of this report coming, um, he concluded the service provider for the Blue Mountains Fire has reviewed the report and can see no benefit for the Town of Blue Mountains Fire Department to be included in the proposed solution at this time. It is important for the Town of Blue Mountain Fire Department to remain at the table to ensure our equipment remains compatible and radio communications remain effective with our neighboring departments in both Simcoe and Gray counties. And further to Mr. Milne's comments, I'm not sure we're going to be included in Gray Bruce. So. Okay, Councillor Doreen. Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Kim, for all the time and efforts, and thanks to the Chiefs for initiating this. Uh, I fully support moving forward. I would like to see the ability to uh, amalgamate uh, the service with Bruce County. I mean, we, as municipality, any of the municipalities on the, uh, the border with Bruce County have mutual aid uh, services with Bruce County Department. So the ability to be able to uh, have one department interact with another is essential with the auto automatic gate agreements that have been developed and are continuing to be developed, um, more than one fire department is typically responding to a fire call. So it is very important that the, uh, the various departments be able to communicate together. So I appreciate the effort and I hope uh, council approves this. Thanks. I see no one else. Council Dobreen, are you still okay? That's why it flashes green. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Through you, I was just wondering through this RFP process, I note that on page 54 that solution three has a possibility of future integration with police and paramedics. So there's um, future opportunity to, to, to roll that out, obviously at a cost. Um, will that be included in the RFP process that then council can determine at which point do they want to engage now if if there's an opportunity to go if, if it can grow to solution number five in three or five years with technology then you know this is a good starting point and I, I would suggest that what, what we're asking for now is is um, approval to move forward with a request for proposal 
and um, the opportunity to continue <clears throat> to have Dan here as a resource to us to put that RFP together. And I would suggest, sorry, <clears throat> I would suggest that um, one of the criteria that we'd be using to evaluate that RFP is, um, you know, how the interoperability opportunities that the, the system that somebody's proposing would provide to us. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, no other comments? And I'll call the question, is it time for that? On the motion before us, all those in favor? Are there any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. <clears throat> We're gonna take a break for lunch and come back.